All right, we are here. You ready to do this? I am ready. All right, Dirty Sports Podcast, episode 669, live in five, four, three. Welcome to the Dirty Sports Podcast. I am your host, Andy Ruther, coming to you live from Cincinnati, Ohio, with my co-host, live from Los Angeles, California, Joey. No chill, pray no. Hello, Andy. Or is it Mr. Unlimited? That's a great. Is that, was that a gift? That was. It was or did a you gift. go out? Did you go to the store and go, I need a Mr. Unlimited jersey? No, it's a gift from Hall of Fame, Dirtball CT, formerly from Seattle, now in middle of the state of Washington. And he sent me a brand spanking new, what, what color is this called? What is this? Highlighter green. Highlighter green, Russell Wilson, Seattle Seahawks jersey. And it, thank you, CT. I it's absolutely Seahawk love it. pupil green. Like for some reason they like, the Seahawk on the jersey has this like green eye. Um, now, I don't know if you saw, did, did you see or hear that Russ did bill simmons podcast i did not you should listen to it <laughs> oh boy it like great quarterback no doubt about it big dork fucking dork Total i mean dork. the amount of like you know i just stay positive and like yeah when we're down i'm just like i've been here a million times in my brain and like I know we're going to win. It's like, it's all like, it's very, it sounds very Scientology. Like he's got, he's got like bad cult vibes. And I mean, you know, being super religious, he's basically in a cult. Yeah. I I think that's what it is. Look, man, if he wants to be positive, cool. But I I get what you're saying. Like total, total door. I mean, I've said that forever about Russ. Uh, But, but the truth is, if you're going to choose, I'd rather have like a dork, positive vibe, that type of guy than just a dick. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I agree with that. I think I, I think the thing is, though, in in sports, especially at like the highest level, it's almost like and, we, and we've certainly seen this in the Seahawks locker room is I think being like a rich entitled dick egomaniac is more like par for the course in the NFL or in, in, in big time sports. So I think like almost super positive religious guy, like rubs teammates the, the wrong way more than like, but, but realistically, I'm going to, obviously I'm going to defend him. There was that hit piece that came out in 2018. I believe it was sports illustrated. I'm not sure. There hasn't been much. I mean, that that was more of like the Legion of Boom. Yeah. You haven't really heard much. And he went to Earl Thomas's wedding, who obviously was in the Legion of Boom. Yeah. My, my point is, you haven't really heard many people complain about Russ, though. Well, I think, I mean, I think they basically made their decision and they've, they've totally stuck with it, which was, we're going to build this team around him now. Sure. We will see this year for sure, but also just moving forward in general. And I, I think, you know, these things take a little while. So like I've been, I've certainly been critical of that kind of strategy as it's worked out for them so far, but they, it tends to take a little while, but they for sure said, screw those guys. We're building around this guy. I mean, it was, it was a very clear decision. We're going to pay you and we're not going to pay them. But, and, but it, no, and I totally understand. But and, again, and and it almost feels like part of that was that they didn't they didn't jive. Well, well, and that's fine. But even in that hit piece, there was never Russ is a dick. You know what I'm saying? Like he's mean. Right. It, it, it was more of preferential treatment that the entire Seahawks organization, from the coaching staff to the GMs, gave Russ even in practice. And we've got obviously a story to tackle in the same thing in the same vein about Kawhi and the Clippers. Yeah. Um, but, but again, I think it's, it's almost like the thing about Russ being a kind of a dork is that 
you know, if you're the best and you get preferential treatment, like you, I'm sure Tom Brady got preferential treatment in New England and Tom Brady's kind of a dick. And it's almost like, because he is, it's almost like he's demanding that. It's almost like when the nerd in class gets preferential treatment, you're like, fuck that nerd. Yeah, I can see that. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah. you sit in the front of the class, you kiss ass. I just feel like the for for the athletes, it's almost like that nerd mentality rubs people the wrong way a little bit. Rightfully or wrongfully, I guess. No, is the- no, no, I think you make a good point. I, I think what you're trying to say is sometimes for whatever reason, and if we look at other athletes, the nerd can rub the other guys the wrong way, whereas the Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant dick mentality for some right. reason makes them like you more because i think everybody in a way like if you get to that level of sports you know there's a there's a talent level there's a thing where you've been they've all been the greatest thing that's ever walked their high school hall their college hall their whatever like they're all in their own way like the biggest diva even though sure. like the divas in the nfl take it to the next level it's almost like, I mean, Russ is a guy who was like a baseball. He went to one school. He went to another school. He's never like, it's not like Russ has been walking around his whole life. Like Mr. Fucking varsity letterman jacket. Like I'm a dick, you know? Yeah. So I think that nerd mentality is like, it's not that it rubs people the wrong way as much as like, they can't relate. It's like, those are the guys we hated in school. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good segue talking about quarterbacks to discuss the bucks Packers game two Hall of Fame future Hall of Fame quarterbacks in Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers a game that none of us saw happening not the way it went down I mean nope. not even not even the way it was out of the game I mean, 10 nothing Packers to start the game and then a pick six I tweeted you know the first pick six of Aaron Rodgers career and then I put that's not a real stat but I wouldn't be surprised if it was and his third pick six of his career yeah he throws it the entire game changes he throws another one that almost goes back for a pick six they end up on like the five or something like that and literally the wheels come off yeah he gets sacked four times it was just in a way it was a uh it was a coming out party my take is for the bucks defense absolutely he's been suspect all year and now they play a great game and and we all know if, if they if they even play to I'd say seventy five percent of that level, they're going to be a tough team to beat. Yeah, I mean they they certainly have a lot of star power, uh, and their and their defensive front is sort of a castaway bunch. But it's like it's one of those like lineups where you're kind of counting on the guys that have been cast off from other teams, whether it be Sue, like uh, just being like kind of a head case. JPP, everything he went through with the fucking hand and all that stuff. But like, when you look at, j- just take those two guys, for example, those are two of the most talented guys on defensive lines. Two guys who, when they had their peak, were total like game changers, where it's like, oh, we have to throw two guys to that. And I think both of those guys are examples of guys like, on any given play, they can be that. Now, if you get them to play at 75% of their potential personally, like if everybody basically does that, if everybody, and and they've also added a bunch of like young guys, you know, uh, their secondary is decent. I I completely agree with you. Now, that being said, I think it was a perfect storm. You look at that offense. I mean, Tom Brady threw for like 175 yards or something like that. Like they didn't exactly light it up, but it was entirely short fields and, you know, the Packers just not getting the ball going. Yeah, he only threw for 166 yards. Gronk had his first TD of the season. Finally, you know, made a mark on the game. Uh, yeah, look, I, I don't – I'm not one of those uh, – when it comes to somebody like Aaron Rodgers, and to be honest, I, as you know, I've kind of been ignoring most of the, the social media stuff. I'm not going to have any hot takes as far as Aaron – you know, he had a bad game at the end of the day, he had a bad game and that doesn't take away from the season that Aaron's played so far, like in my opinion, but like, I think people forget that football is such a tough sport. It's just, you know, 
17 games. Are, are they doing 17 games this year? Or is that next year? Next, uh, year? next year, I believe. But my point is like guys are going to have bad weeks. So, so I, I don't take away him having a bad game. Like there's not many take that doesn't to me affect how I view him. And also the first, you know, four or five weeks that he's played before. Right. Like, no, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. Like, you can't – there's there's nothing about that game that says Aaron Rodgers didn't play well. Like, Aaron Rodgers didn't play well, but like anything, just like the Tom Brady Super Bowls that he lost. Like, when you get pressured nonstop and when you're not built around running the ball, which they were doing a great stop, job stopping the run early, it – it totally changes your offense. I also thought super early on in the uh, game, um, he was forcing the ball to Devonte Adams a little bit too much, uh, who had just returned from injury, obviously, and was his go-to guy. But it just was a perfect storm. the The Bucks defense played well. Um, they were getting to Brady. They were getting to Rodgers. They weren't running the ball that well, and it was like literally those two picks that happened back to back. I mean the whole course of the game changes. Sure. And, you know, you, if that, if one of those doesn't, if that first one isn't run back for a touchdown, like who knows how the game goes. I just, well, it, you know, it's more, like you said, I think a testament to the Bucks defense than the Packers not showing up or something like that. And football is such a, you know, at, at the highest level, when you play in the NFL, as you know, Prano, there's a reason that term any given Sunday exists. And, that's why I, I like what Aaron Rodgers said after the game, as far as like, we needed to be humbled because, you know, I was one of those people who was saying they're the best team in the NFC right now. And it just shows, Hey man, on any given week, you can get your ass kicked. Absolutely. And, and I think that just because that happens, you know, you can say obviously that they're susceptible. Every team is susceptible, but like, I don't think anybody watched the chiefs Raiders game last week and said, Oh, the Chiefs aren't the best team in the AFC. Yeah. Like, is anybody like, oh, oh now we got to find new best team? Like, I I almost stand by the Packers are probably the best team in the NFC. Yeah. Um, you know, the 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 other thing is momentum. And I want to talk about that as as it relates to this game and also segue into just a lot of the just reckless coaching behavior that I've seen going gone on. I just think that this math and we talked about it last week and this like what when should we go for it when should we not like none of these analytics take into consideration momentum and nothing proves more how important momentum is than a pick six in that Packers game changed everything sure everything the momentum just totally shifted and that really can't be calculated. And I really think that these statistics, these analytics, the book that just doesn't consider the momentum. I mean, I've seen so many horrifically dumb going for it, not kicking the field goals. I mean, the end of the Texans Titans game, let's talk the about Minnesota it. game, the end of the Washington game. Like it's so stupid. Well, let's delve into some of those. I agree that Romeo Cornell going for two against the Titans. Talk about the, 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 the only explanation I have is the Tom Brady at the end of the game. Like, like did they, did somebody have to come to him after and be like, we were trying to tell you beforehand, but we were already up seven. And he's like, Oh, Oh, Whoa. We were up seven. No, I thought we were he, up six. Romeo Cornell said after the game, he wanted to put the game away. So stupid. It's it's up there with one of the dumbest ones I've ever seen. I agree. No one's ever said, let's make it nine. You know I, what puts the game away, essentially, is eight. going up eight points. Yeah. Because even if you give up that touchdown, it's really tough to get that two-point conversion. Uh, well, I, I actually, was, uh, excuse me, The uh, if you look at it, I have uh, broken it down. I talked to Elon Musk, and he says uh, going up nine there uh, increases your uh, game-winning uh, percent chances to 99.9%. Uh, .9%. It's almost <laughs> as uh, certain that you win as it is that you survive uh, COVID. But, you know, th there's a lot of factors, and uh, going up seven actually decreases your chances of winning by 0.5%. Momentum is fucking real. 
when yeah. they stop you there, they feel great. I know. And I was confused. So, you know, I had that game on, uh, on the, you know, the cube of, of, I had like all the games on basically, of course, the Sunday ticket. And I was, you know, that was in, that was in the top right screen of my, my, my four box game. And I was like, what? You know, I'm like relooking at the score. I was confused. And then of course, Tennessee goes right down, scores with four seconds left. Tannehill's great on those last, yeah, last drives. He's been great for the last year and a half. Then they, of course, they went in OT. Uh, Henry was a beast. I, by the way, I love, I love Vrabel. How quickly is Vrabel on the opposite end moving up as far as the great coaches at the NFL? Yeah. And, and he, everything about this, the, 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 the end of that game, I mean, you just sent it to me and it's been going around, but like the Vrabel purposely taking a 12 man on the field penalty to give a Texans a first down, but also stop the clock. I mean, they score with four seconds left. The idea that, I, I mean, obviously anything can happen. They would, they would know they have to move the ball faster, but he was basically like, I know every second is going to count and I'm going to save a couple seconds. That was genius. And if you, if you guys haven't seen it, like look it up. I mean, he it's basically Warren Sharp tweeted it out. Yeah. He saved 40 he seconds. purposely takes a, 12 man on the field thing. And then he's screaming and yelling about how they should get off the field. Like he totally plays it up. Yeah. And, and it's just genius. And they come back and obviously they get to tie the game with four seconds left on a, on a terrible call where he was clearly out of bounds. And I don't know why the referees can't fucking do something about that, but that's a whole other wormhole about referees, not admitting they're wrong. Let's just not like, I was he want, was he out of bounds though? I, I was struggling on that one. If I knew, it, it really seemed like he got one foot down, and then he gets an elbow down, and then he gets the other foot down. Like yeah. it seemed obvious to me, but they're like, "Well, is it enough to overturn?" It's like I hate this enough to overturn. Yeah. Thing. Well, you Just know what else? You have what the else replay I, guy in a vacuum. He's never seen the play before. Call it for the first time. Yeah. What I also liked is I love that play call in overtime on third down. I, I just love the Derrick Henry's already mashed them for 200 plus yards. I love on the two yard line saying, Hey, we're going to just directly hike it to our guy. Stop yeah. him. Yeah. Like to, to me, that, that is going with your strengths. That's a brilliant play call. And obviously they didn't. And I, I think Vrabel gets underappreciated. You know, he led them to the AFC championship last year. He's only been coaching a few years. We talk a lot about, the Sean McVay's and the Kyle Shanahan's. I, I just don't know how you don't put Mike Vrabel right up there. And to be honest, maybe even ahead of some of those guys. I don't know. I mean, they've been to Super Bowls, but. Well, I, I think, I think, and I agree with you. And I think the reason that you should put him up there with them and maybe put him above them is because we've seen that look before offensive genius looks great has an, has a brilliant thing. They teams figure it out they, they have a setback. There's some, you know, uh, creativity to the Titans offense, but it's really much more kind of old fashioned than sure. what Sean McVay does. And, 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 and the newfangled offense. I mean, yeah, there's, you know, the direct snap, I mean, but the direct snap is, is, is more of an old school play than anything in a way, yeah. you know, and he's building it on defense. He's built like Ryan Tannehill looks great. And, you know, he thrives in the game manager plus role, you know, it's almost like game manager, but like, I can, I can play really well. And when we're playing well, I, I can, you know, be throwing for four touchdowns. So I, I absolutely agree with you. And just the little things, like it's very Belichickian, those, oh, little, yeah. those little moves. I mean, of all the, the Belichick coaching tree, by far, the one who most resembles him and his style has got to be Vrabel. And it's funny because that was, you know, a battle of the ex-Patriots coaches. And you got Vrabel on one side who's, you know, running like purposeful 12 man on the field to save four seconds. And on the other side, Romeo Cornell has got a magic eight ball and he's like, should we go for two? (laughs) 
I will say though, look at the Houston Texans. The minute the boob left, Bill O'Brien, they yeah. win last week. They come from behind, but like they're playing, they're fighting right now. Yeah. They come from behind. They take a lead yesterday. The minute they just, they cut that boob, they're suddenly playing great. They, they got a mastectomy. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. When you have, when <laughs> they you have had the boob, cancer. they had the boob removed. Yeah, exactly. They cut that boob. And now they're stuck with a, a giant black areola who is uh, yeah. Romeo Cornell. It's funny because he looks so much more like a boob. He does. Romeo Cornell looks exact. I mean, it was going around on the internet all the weekend. Romeo Cornell is basically Cardi B's boob. Oh, my God. That was so gross. <laughs> you, you know, I missed that. Again, like. We know, now I'm- go to Cardi B's boob to find out if we should go for two. Like. Get a bucket and a mop for this wet ass two point <laughs> conversion. I'm writing that down. Romeo Cornell is Cardi B's boob. <laughs> I mean, that, that's that could be an all time dirty sports title. <laughs> I mean, we have to make that the title of this episode, right? <laughs> I mean, canceled. I don't even know why, but something in there is getting us canceled. God, that boob, Prano. Yeah. Did you, did you look at it with your girl? Was, was there any discussion? I'm curious what a female would say. I actually, you know what? It's funny. I actually didn't even see the, the picture. I saw, oh. I saw, I saw 25, you know, when something like this happens, you see 25 like memes of it. Yeah. I saw 25 different memes, but I never actually saw the original. This was one of those black Twitter, do your thing. And they did. Yeah. yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's like here guys, it's been hoisted up for you. Do your thing, make us proud, make us laugh. And as usual, black Twitter delivered. Yeah. So I want to ask about the, the 49ers, not sorry, not the 49ers, but we're going to talk about that game. I want to ask about the Rams for last night's game. Rams didn't look that good against the 49ers. No. The Rams, who I kind of had lost track, three of their four wins were against the NFC East. Yes. So I see a lot of people discussing this today. I think it's a legitimate discussion. How good are the Rams? It's a great question. I really thought the Rams, I thought before the season started that the Rams were going to be good. I thought they were going to have a return after a Super Bowl hangover year. Uh, They looked great out of the gate. Obviously, the NFC East is even worse than anybody could have predicted. They lose a game to the Bills. I think the, I think the, the thing that gives me pause about the Rams in, in, saying that they're great, but also say, dismissing them as bad or, or not as good as their record is that Bills game. They lost that Bills game. They were down big in that Bills game, but they came back against a good Bills defense and they, and they damn near won that game. And it was, it was the fight that they showed in that game that I was like, okay, they're four and one. The game they lost prior to last night, they're four and one, the game they lost to the Bills and they damn near won it. Um, but they didn't win it. They don't win last night. They look really bad offensively. Um, yeah. I, and, and honestly, they didn't look incredible defensively no. either. They get with tons of third down conversions. Yeah, they couldn't stop the 49ers. Uh, so it's a great question of how good the Rams are. I, I really thought that they were going to be really good. And they're, look, you are what your record is. It's not like four and two is bad. Sure. But um they're not, they're, they're certainly not going to be the powerhouse. Like I, I thought they were going to be, you look at the, you look at that chiefs game that we went to that Monday night game. Long gone are the Rams that are just going to be able to put up. If you're putting up points, they're going to put up points to keep up with you. Yeah. I mean, that's and, just two and, seasons ago. And Jared Goff, I mean, the amount of like, he essentially in his career, he's never made especially great throws. He makes the easy throws. Good, good for him. But I mean, tight windows. I almost feel like Jared Goff throws the ball at the ground in tight windows so as not to throw interceptions. Like he'll have these crossing routes where he, you know, a guy's crossing at 12 or 15 yards. He throws it six yards. And you're going, what are you doing? I mean, he's really holding steady on that medium pizza title. Yeah, he is. He is. He is a straight up Domino's medium. It's already in your cart. It's already in your pizza profile. Yeah. Just like I order a medium. I know what I'm getting. I, I just, I don't think, again, it's one game, but 
I'd, I'd be very cautious as a Rams fan with, again, three of those wins against the NFC. I, I, I think overall, and obviously they have a lot of injuries, I think the 49ers are a better team. And clearly they went to the Super Bowl last year. But I think, I think that division, in my opinion, I, I'm already this early to say I think it's going to be the 49ers and Seahawks competing for that division. Wow. I mean, the idea that the I, – I thought you were just going to say that it's the Seahawks division. I mean, the idea of the 49ers are what now? Three and three? Three and three, correct. Yeah. I mean, your Seahawks are five and oh? Four yeah, now? five and oh. Yeah. But also, again, the Seahawks as well have not played a division game. Like, right. Like, but, you know, that's a tough division. Arizona is going to be tough for everybody. Arizona could win nine, 10 games. Yeah. So let's move, let's move along on these games. I don't have too much to say about uh, dolphins jets. I did not watch any of that game. Uh, Fitz seems to be playing well. The defense shut out. I mean, the, the, the jets are just a dumpster fire. The jets are a dumpster fire. Tua got his first couple plays. Yeah. And then sat on the field after the game alone by himself. Some weird Kobe Bryant shooting after the fact. Like, well, welcome back, Tua. Congrats. Well, I think he went through such a traumatic injury. Yeah. They didn't know if he could play football again. Yeah. So I, I, I see you snickering over there, though. No, it's just like, look, I, I, I understand the emotion. But it, to me, sometimes that feels like you're doing it for a camera, right? Like, Ooh, interesting. Yeah. I uh, just a little bit. He's well, just never... sitting on the field, like at the 15, he's just sitting at the 15 yard line in his, in his uniform. Well, he's in a great situation by the way. And, and I know he, he's been very complimentary of Fitz as far as how he's coached him up both on and off the field. I mean, the dolphins are now sitting at three and three. They definitely. I mean, I, I've, I've been saying that for a long time too. Like, if you're if you're a team, the idea that you don't want Fitz as a starter ahead of a guy who's young. The guy went to Harvard. He's been in the league for how long? He's 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 quickly climbing the career quarterback list. Like, he's like, I mean, I know we did it, and and we've we've a lot of people have had to take their L's, you know. And I've I've given Russ the credit where the credits due in terms of becoming the quarterback a lot of people overrated him to be for years but it's like we were on the show talking about Fitz is bad like Ryan Fitzpatrick is really good at this point like well, 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 well hold on I, I think the argument the big blowout discussion was when Sarah Tiana was on I, I believe it was was that three or four years ago it was I never once called him bad I said he's a he's a good average he's an average mediocre quarterback for a starter I mean, you're now saying really good. This is what I'll say. This is what I'll say about Fitz. He, he plays the role very, very well, and he's an extremely competent QB. Do I have confidence in him possibly making the playoffs as my quarterback? Yes. But the, the thing about really good is, you know, we do it for everybody. I mean, we do it for Brady. Oh, he's ah, oh, it's first time with a new system. You know, give it a couple weeks. Like Ryan Fitzpatrick's a new system every fucking day the guy every team he's on is bad he goes to another bad team they fire coaches in the middle of the year i mean this guy learns a playbook faster than i can learn you know my lines for an audition well the well guy's... sure no, no denying that but but again my argument always back would look look, look he, he's a good quality quarterback i'll say that much and i've never said that before he's, he's a good quality quarterback in the nfl it's great Are you to happy say it. yeah very happy does that feel good yeah you know and, 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 I, and I'm for real. I think they are, even at three and three, I know it's going to be tough. I think they have a good chance of making the playoffs. I mean, they're ahead of the Patriots now. I think the Patriots, it, it's hard to write off the Patriots even at two and three. But uh, the Bills, look, the Bills lost last week and they come, you know, they have the Chiefs tonight. A what loss, we, a loss and they're a game up. Where are we at in the Patriots, Joe? Because I had that game on, of course, and it's... God, it was tough to watch. But like, I, obviously- felt, I felt like Cam might have still had COVID. I mean, I know the NFL where we're going to talk about it is like the the false positives and the quickly removing any doubt from people that like COVID is a thing. Like, I think Cam straight up like, like 
Cam's still infected. <laughs> like he played bad. He played really that last throw, open receiver. But that's that's what I've said about Cam forever, which no is accuracy. Cam, Cam is not a good passing quarterback. And the idea of building around Cam, it just doesn't make sense. As he gets older, his effectiveness goes out the window because Basically, his effectiveness is built on the idea that he's also a tailback, and that's very hard to defend. But, you know, I like the move from the Patriots of getting a guy and just working him to the bone for one year. But you're also going to get into these situations where sometimes you just need to make a throw, and Cam is never going to just make a throw. Yeah. He's just not. Well, again, really tough to watch. They were losing 18-3. to three. Their defense did their thing, holding the Broncos to six field goals. And – I think part of it, though, I mean, let's realistically look at it. They haven't really practiced much. Right. Not to make excuses for two weeks now because of COVID. Right. Right. And and that's a whole issue that you and I were texting about. We agree. Look, I'm not ready to raise these conspiracy theory flags, but, you know, I said going into this season, how are we actually going to know if guys are testing positive legitimately? And this was my skepticism was based on how the NFL had hid CTE for all those years, the effects of brain damage, and they lied about it. So you and I were laughing and you made a great point over text. The NFL has had more false positives than all the other sports leagues combined. Yeah. And you can say like, that's a whole wormhole to go down. But the other, the other thing is, let's, let's start with the idea of just even this Patriots. Let's, let's take it at face value. Okay, the Patriots get, you know, positive COVID tests. And then, like, in that division, you're looking at, you know, do two teams out of that division make it? The, a loss here and a loss there because you can't practice for a couple of weeks. It's, it's kind of, it, like, it, again, it throws the whole season into like okay this is just the season we're gonna play we're just gonna say we're just plugging through no matter what happens we're playing these football games and now teams get positives but so they can't play practice for a day then we get the false positives and they come back it's like yeah i i was saying to you it's like i've heard the term false positive more about the nfl than i have about anything else and then like i mean this same thing with College football. I mean, Saban oh, I don't gets a false it. positive, and now he's fine. It's no, like, it wasn't even a false positive. Negative. Nick Saban tested negative for three days in a row, right after he had it. Yeah. Look, look, like you said, it is it is a whole rabbit hole, and I don't want to fully get into it. I'll just make it quick. I don't trust this shit. This isn't conspiracy theories. I know how stuff works. I've obviously yeah. personally gone through a lot of it. It's it's you don't <laughs> Joe we both know you don't test positive and then test negative two days later yeah that's not how the I virus mean, works yeah and and that's the thing is like unless you're telling me that that was some false positive and whatever it's like this is something the the I have it and now I don't have it anymore like Trump's the first person that happened to and now basically anybody that's important. We're going, yeah, he had it, but now he doesn't have it and he's not contagious anymore. It's like, look, I love sports. I want sports to happen. I'm not saying cancel every single thing and everybody stay in your house. All I'm saying is there has to be some sort of like level playing field. Well, just transparency. Yeah. The idea that some teams can go like, no. And then we test them again. And Nick Saban's definitely fine. And our quarterbacks are fine, but this guy's got to sit out. It just, it just kind of sucks. Yeah. And I'm like you, I'm not trying to cancel sports. To be honest, I don't really give a shit. To be honest, I, I don't really care, but just be honest. Yeah. Don't, don't lie. All these, all these false positives, it, it doesn't add up to me. And I agree with you. I think they're covering something up. I want to talk about the two Ohio teams right now. I want, I want to talk, we'll first talk Brown Steelers. Just an ass beating they took. Yeah. I mean, I am. Pick six really early from Baker. I am like the Brown. Nothing about the, nothing about the Browns coming out and doing this surprises me. It's exactly. like, 
it, you know, I, I thought the Browns could win this game. And I think the Browns as an organization almost need to win this game to, you know, say we have made the leap. We're not going to like face our division rival that's owned us forever and just roll over. They did exactly that. I mean, you said it Brown's going to Brown. I watched a lot of that game and it's also like, For a while there, the Steelers didn't look that good and were pulling away in the game. Well, I I think defensively they did. Yeah, defensively they did. But like Roethlisberger looked pretty bad to start. They're running weird RPOs where it's like he almost doesn't have a grip on the ball. The talk out of the gate was, was he hurt? And then like, of course, they end up, you know, winning by 30 points. I mean, they blew them out. You know, Cleveland was never in that game. And you're right. Cleveland, if they want to make the next step, here's a fun stat for you. Since 2015, the Browns are combined 4-17-1 against the Steelers and Ravens. So the numbers don't lie. And this year, against the two top dogs in that division, Baltimore and Pittsburgh, Cleveland has lost a combined 76-13. to Right. So, so they're, they're kind of in that Rams area of, okay, they're 4-2, and two, but when they've played a couple good teams, yeah, they've been absolutely destroyed. I almost feel like that that's kind of across the board in the, in the NFL at this point. I mean, you talk about it, it's almost like our economy. Like it's almost like there's no middle class anymore. Yeah, there's there's dog shit teams and there's good teams. And the question is, are you good or have you only played the dog shit teams? Yeah, and and, and I think by the end of the year, what happens is we start to figure out who that middle class is because teams get to play against the better teams. But like, yeah, I, I I still really don't know what to make of Pittsburgh. I think they're good because do you think Pittsburgh is better than Baltimore? I think they're very even. I'm not ready to call them better, but I think, you know, Pittsburgh hasn't lost a game. Yeah. We'll see but, how they do but, and, and again, next week. Yeah. And again, they've, they've played a lot of bad teams, but they beat the shit out of the Browns who were four and one. Yeah. Baker, the ringer did a really good article on Baker. He's in his third year. That, that game to me, and he had been improving and we had both been complimentary. I mean, he Baker so far. I mean, he had, did have hurt ribs. He did get benched. He looked bad. The the problem with Baker is when nothing's there, he still – there hasn't been that progression of a QB, Joe, where he's not forcing it. Absolutely. He's he's sort of a one-read guy. He knows where his star – couple of star receivers are. It's which one is he going to on any given play. And that's just a very – you know what that is to me is – and I, I, this is my, this is like the, my, my Joe Prano signature quarterback evaluation is that's a guy who played in college for a great team who had to have one fucking read. And if he didn't have one read, he's protected enough where he can take his time and sl- casually look for another read or casually run away. Like it just seems to me as being like a guy who's good when, it's easy and bad when it's not easy. And I think the great quarterbacks, the, even the good quarterbacks, like overcoming a bad situation. I mean, we were talking about Fitzpatrick before I put your, you know, feet to the fire. It's like that guy has lived for 15 years in the NFL, always in a bad situation, always. And he survived Baker Mayfield. It's like, you look great until you get to a week where there's a bad situation and then you're a mess. Yeah. And then he was a mess. Yeah. Complete, not a a mess. mess. That's why I want to beg the question. I put this on the rundown. I know he's only played six games, but gun to your head, Joe Burrow or Baker Mayfield moving forward. I, I don't even think that's a question. I don't think it's a question either. It's, it's Joe Burrow for me. Yeah. I don't even think that's a question. I Joe, Burrow's, see- Joe Burrow's Joe Burrow's doing what, like quarterbacks who go on to be great do, which is they come in, they get drafted by a terrible team and they immediately make them in every game, every week, 
Like, obviously, they had a bad game against the Ravens, but, like, to be leading that game. They're up 21 to nothing. Is that, like, look, you come out and you play really well, and there's only so much one man can do. And so I bang, think be, Bengals being are going to bangle. Being, yeah. Being on the Bengals is going to catch up with you. Yeah. But I think he's looked incredible. I agree. And he's had some bad picks. He had yeah. a bad pick to end the game. And he's going to have bad picks. But, <coughs> but yeah, it's like yesterday. And I knew it. I was texting my brother when the Bengals went up 21 nothing in the second quarter. I texted him. I said 100% the Bengals lose this game. I live, I live bet the game. I live bet. I bet, I bet the Colts to come back when they're down 21 nothing. It's, it's, it's the bet of the day. Because like you said, that's a, that's a great call. There's only so much he can do. He can't yeah. play defense. And I agree. I, Joe, I don't think it's even close. It's no, he, I don't again, either. only six games. I think he's shown. I can kind of put this team on my back and take them as far as I can. Yeah. I mean, right now if you swap them. I think the Cleveland Browns get better. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. What, what do we make of the Colts? The Colts looked kind of shaky. Dude, the Colts, like, there will be college classes taught years from now on entitled, What Do You Make of the 2020 Colts? It's like, <laughs> it's like, there's so many question marks. Their defense is good, but yet their defense will give up 21 quick points to the fucking Bengals. Obviously, their running game is strong. They have a great offensive line. They lost uh, what's his name to start the year to an injury. Uh, Philip Rivers is he washed? Is he not? Like I, I think the question for the, at this point of Philip Rivers is he's washed, but how how washed is he? <laughs> like, no, oh, he's confusing. You're right because because yeah. like the first quarter he plays terrible. Second quarter he throws for over 200 yards. He goes kind of MIA again in the second half for a bit. It's he is, he is a real, he's an enigma. I like, I can't, yeah. I can't figure out Philip Rivers. I mean, I think the, and obviously I've been on this train with the Colts for a while is I think that the Colts were good enough where they needed a veteran QB to come in. I think I, I thought it was just obviously after Andrew Luck retires and I get that that's a last minute situation. It's like they're, they were built to win. They did win a playoff game two seasons ago. Uh, not, not, having some sort of plan or not having some sort of backup for uh, Andrew Luck, who has had, you know, had major injuries in his career was kind of reckless that I just thought it was a punt of a season last year to go with Jacoby Briscoli. And, uh, and then you get rivers and maybe you get them a year or two late, or maybe look, I, the thing about this Colts team is let's say the Colts make the playoffs. Let's say like, I have no confidence in Phillip rivers when he's not washed pre-wash Philip Rivers. I have no confidence in like Philip Rivers is anti-clutch. All these wash pre-wash. I, I just need Philip Rivers face on a washing machine. I just need Philip Rivers on, uh, on jeans on different whitewashed, you know, stone washed, <laughs> pre-washed, dark washed. Ugh. What pair of jeans is Philip Rivers? Is he like the holy rock star jeans? Is he like a whitewashed Kelly Kapowski pair? I like this. I think this is our new pizza thing. What yeah. gene, What jeans is Philip Rivers going to show up on Sunday for the yeah. game? We know one thing. He's not going to be crisp, ironed, dark blue jeans. No. That'll never happen. No. Staying with quarterbacks, let's move to the Falcons-Vikings game, and I'll pose this question to you. Does Kirk Cousins get benched during this 2020 season? Probably not because their backup is Sean Mannion, which I'll say this. That GM should be fired already for two reasons. One, for giving Kirk Cousins $30 million. Two, for giving Kirk Cousins $30 million and not having somebody to back him up. You're all in on Kirk Cousins. You like that? You guys like being one in four? You like that? Like, I, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. The least valuable player in the NFL opens the game with a pick yesterday, throws three picks. Oh, wait. So you're telling me Kirk Cousins' team isn't dominatingly good, and now he looks bad, just like Kirk Cousins has in every single second of his career? 
Well, he had no Dalvin Cook yesterday. When he doesn't have his star running back, he's 100% exposed. When Kirk Cousins isn't getting protected, the offense isn't running the ball well, and the defense isn't shutting you down, Kirk Cousins is bad. B-A-D, bad. He has been since the fucking Redskins. And they're like, they didn't give him a deal. Imagine being the Washington Redskins and saying, we're not sure this is our guy. They were, they were bad. They've been bad for a long time. They weren't ready to commit to him. And they were right. And then Zimmer, I mean, the, the Zimmer fucking math at this point. Dude, at some point, you just got to kick a field goal. At some point. Is the field goal kicker broken? Is he hurt? Kick a field goal, dude. Get some points. Get that, get that hot girl you're dating, Zim, to go out there and kick a field goal. It, like yesterday, they're, I believe they're down 10 nothing. They go in. They get stuffed and stuffed and stuffed at the goal line. And they just keep going for it. And they, they've done this. now. This is now two weeks in a row. It's not about what the math says and the analytics. Like, dude, at some point, make your team feel like you can score a fucking point. Yeah. Get some momentum in terms of points going. Well, he, you know, I was a big Zimmer supporter uh, for a few years, but you know, I, it's like week by week, I'm, he's losing me. What are you doing, Zim? Well, again, a defensive coach. They're, they they've had a good defense the last few years. The defense is meh now, and it's like you have to be able to shift. Like we saw, I know comparing everybody to Belichick is not really fair. But Belichick went from defensive teams to offensive teams, back to defensive teams. Like you got to go with what your personnel is. And the bottom line is Kirk Cousins stinks. And you've got Sean Mann. Like the idea that you don't have a competent backup for these situations. Like honestly, punt on the season, lose all your games, try to lose more games than the Jets. Try to get Trevor Lawrence. That's impossible. I, I agree it's impossible, but like the Vikings are fucking terrible. Yeah. And 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 look, I love it. I've been trying to like I've had so many angry Vikings fans over the years. I'm going, guys, what do you want me to tell you? You're you're all you all have these grand plans. Well, if Kirk can just do this, if Kirk can just do that, great. How's that working out for you? Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about another bad coaching move. You alluded to it earlier. Old Riverboat Ron going for two for the win. Washington against your Giants. It's a ballsy move. Let, let's let, – let's, I want to do, break this down from a number of levels. First of all, the Giants have four, you know, fourth and goal at the one earlier in the game. They kick it. They end up winning this game by one point. So sometimes the fucking analytics are wrong, guys. Also, the – I like the call. By Riverboat Ron. I'm, I'm for it. Look, yeah, I don't we gotta it. learn. We, we learn when my problem with it is this. It's the NFC East. The four wins is gonna win the division. <laughs> how do you not take how do you not how do you not play for overtime? Sure, that's a good point. If you go to overtime and no one scores because both teams are really bad, and you get a tie, you're now tied for first place in the division. <laughs> like <laughs> We are talking about a division that may or may not be decided by a tie. Like five wins and a tie could legit win you to the division. Yeah. So if, you know, if the Eagles or the Cowboys are running away with this division and the Giants and the Redskins are fighting for last place, which they essentially are, I love it. A couple of years ago, Vrabel did this with the Titans. They get it, they win, and it was like the... You know, this is setting a tone for our franchise. If that, if that's Ron Rivera's thought is I'm going to set a tone for this franchise. Like this, it's not about this year. It's about building a culture. Fine. I'm okay with it. My problem with that reasoning is what about this year, dude? Wouldn't it be nice to make the playoffs, even if it's with a five win team? Yeah. By the way, Prano, that game, because there was a lot of blowouts yesterday. So I had that game on because it was close. That was one of the most difficult games to have on a TV screen ever. The Giants Redskins game. Oh, so yeah. brutal. Yeah, it's bad. So brutal. I mean, I, as a as a Giants fan and as a guy whose team is in that division, 
Like, like people who have a team in the NFC East, you should, you know, how they're, they give out the, the stimulus checks yeah. during COVID and they're probably going to give out more. Like you guys need like an additional $400 or something. I, I couldn't agree more for your mental health. I mean, for me, it's like, I'm watching the game going like what, like I'm just doing an evaluation of the team for the future. Like the giants defense has looked pretty good so far. They have, I mean, I think coming into the game yesterday, they were like eighth in the league. They're bad on third down. So that's something that you gotta, you gotta sort out, but like the giants haven't had a good defense since Bill Parcells, you know, I know everybody wants to slurp the giants defenses that won them the Super Bowls, but like, Getting hot in the playoffs is different than having a good defense. And I, it has been a long time as a Giants fan since I was like, oh, we go out, we play defense, we give ourselves a chance to win. And yes, they've been playing other NFC East teams. Yes, they've been playing, you know, the Rams, whatever. But like at, at some point you've got to build somewhere. So I'm looking at it as like, what's going to happen next year? I'm evaluating Danny Dimes. Is he the guy going forward? Uh, obviously at some point you got to get Saquon back for next year. Hopefully who who are our weapons? What are we doing? Like, so to me, I'm not even thinking about, Oh, let's, let's get our one win and pull within a game of first place and make the playoffs. Because uh, again, I'd rather be bad than be a six win playoff team that gets blown out by somebody coming to New York. Yeah. Let's stay with that division. I want to ask, will Carson Wentz be the Eagles starter opening game 2021? That's a tough one. It is. I'm going to say yes, but I don't feel super confident about it. And nor should I. He hasn't played well. I mean, he's been bad. And, yeah. and look – small school guy. So he has, he doesn't have this thing that I talked about with Baker, but when I look at Carson Wentz's career, it's very similar. When, when the going's good, he looks great. And when it's bad, he looks awful. And the truth is you kind of like, if you're going to be a elite quarterback, you got to live in the middle. Yeah. It's like be great when your team's great, but like, you can I mean, when he's bad, so bad. You, you're right. I had that game on and obviously it was a blowout and he did make a great second half comeback. The Eagles did as a team. I mean, when he's bad, that team is bad. The NFC East is a terrible situation. God, the, quarter, bad. the quarterback situation in the NFC East is terrible, especially with Dak out. And that being said, I don't know if Carson Wentz is the best current starter in the NFC East, the worst current starter in the NFC East. Like, truly, I don't know that Wentz is better than Andy Dalton. I don't know that Wentz is better than Daniel Jones. I think it's safe to say that Wentz is better than Kyle Allen, but, like, not that safe. Yeah. I mean, he's better than Kyle Allen, but, man, he just struggles. You see that fight that happened in the stands? Yeah, I did. Uh, Philly. I mean, Philly's unbelievable. Philly versus Ravens. I said, I assume they were fighting over how many O's there are in water. (laughs) There's three O's in water. No, there's four O's in water. No, your crabs are better than cheesesteaks. No way. Cheesesteaks are better than crabs. And then they both drop the N-word and they fight. I mean, the mid-Atlantic region, what a garbage area. Yeah, I, especially during, you know, the social distancing. You're like, this is like inevitable. Weird. Like, I want to know what makes the mid-Atlantic region so bad. It's like, it's almost like weird colonial history. And then you start there in the Bay, but like, you never moved on to greener pastures. Just like, no, we, we love it down here. We love Philly and Maryland. And- See, I haven't spent too much time there. I, in fact, that's probably one of the, the, as far as where I've been in the country, the, the least amount of time I've spent is like the mid-Atlantic and like the upper Northeast. 
and the upper Northwest. I, I basically hit every other spot. So I've never been to Baltimore. I've been to Maryland. I've been to Philly, but like, I'm not as, for, I've been to DC. I'm not as familiar with, uh, you know, those types of people, but from what I see online, it kind of really fits your stereotypes. I mean, f- we're in a pandemic. No one's wearing a mask and they're fist fighting. And you're like, <laughs> okay, guys, Phil, let me talk about Philly going to Philly. Philly going to Philly. I got to ask. And, and I got to say, I, I've, I've dealt with a lot of like people who refuse to admit when they're wrong. I mean, uh, listen, I'm still battling like Kirk Cousins defenders and like all these people. But if you're one of these people who are like, Philly gets a bad rap under these videos, ugh. Oh my God. I mean, talk, talk about like how to fix America. Start by removing anybody that goes under a video where a piece of Philly trash is doing piece of Philly trash things. And they're going like, this is the media giving us just immediately eradicate those people. If we could have like a seal team six that tracks those people down, goes to their home, murders, <laughs> like we're immediately improving the quality of human in America. We just get a bad rap. Like, like the media's out to get Philadelphia. I, I know. A guy ate horse feces after you won a Super Bowl. Every team eats horse feces. <laughs> but when Philly does it, it's a national story. Oh, man. Breno, I have to ask you this question. Are the Chicago Bears the worst 5-1 and one team in the history of the NFL? The Chicago – I mean – it's funny because what are I, they? I got burned on the the Bears Colts game uh, a couple of weeks ago, but Bears Colts is there. I mean, talk about pointing Spider Man meme. Quarterback questions, good defenses, talent yeah. questions on the offensive side of the ball, inconsistencies. Like, and I I feel like they, those teams couldn't be more similar. Um, Yes, they're 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 not a good five and one team in my opinion. But the they're five and one though, like that's what's yeah. crazy. The the difference with the Bears is the Bears have Khalil Mack. The Bears have defensive playmakers, and I think their attitude has got to be: look, we need competent quarterback play. We need to just do whatever it takes offensively, but defensively, we've got to be great. Well, I, I think we're going to learn a lot about the Bears because they play I – mean, l- listen to their next three games. They're at the Rams for Sunday night football. They play the Saints at home, and they're at the Titans. Yeah. So, like we're saying, they're 5-1. and one. We're going to learn a lot after those three. If they go 2-1 and one in those three games, yeah. you got to say, hey, man. Yeah, you go, you're 7 and, you're seven and 2. Yeah. If you go 3, you're 6-4. and four. Or you go, you're five and four. Yeah. So. Exactly. So I, I just, I, I can't, they are, they are very, very difficult team to watch as well because the offense is just so stagnant and so just, it's, it's just like a mundane game to watch. And you're like, oh, uh, like I had that game on and just watching those two offenses just sputter. Yeah, I agree. And the last game, which we didn't discuss, and I don't really want to discuss too much, is the, the cat game. <laughs> the Jags, Lions, the Lions are now two and three. Yeah. And uh, I, I thought that was a bit of a trap game for the Lions. I could have totally seen them losing that game. The Lions have been terrible on the road in recent history. But I, the Lions, if they're going to be competent, if they're going to be competitive, if they're going to be whatever, they've got to start being a team that beats bad teams. And props to them for doing that. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I think everybody saw the tweet yesterday of the, the sidearm Matt Stafford pass. Somebody tweeted if Pat Mahomes did this, Patrick Mahomes did this, you know, the announcers would be coming on themselves. And, um, you know, I think, I think Matt Stafford criminally underrated and uh, he's got to prove it though. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I think he's a really good quarterback. Well, Joe, that is our NFL week six recap. I cannot wait to get some food after the show. In fact, I'm going to eat some of 
my Butcher Box, because today's show is also sponsored by Butcher Box. I absolutely love the meat that I get from Butcher Box. I know you enjoy it as well. There's no hidden costs. They just send you amazing meat every month. It's high quality right to your house. It's free of antibiotics and added hormones. Each box has nine to 11 pounds of meat, enough for 24 individuals, which is great because I live by myself right now and I got four brothers. I got seven nephews and nieces. I should invite them all over and we can eat some amazing, d- delicious butcher box. I'm, I, I feel exactly the same way. I, I now live with a vegetarian and I love that I have, when the butcher box shows up, it goes in my freezer and I know that I'm going to be the only one to eat it. I, I would just go, I got nine to 11 pounds of meat in there. Let's go. Yeah. Well, right now, butcher box is offering new members two lobster tails and two filet mignons for free in their first surf and box. turf dog. That's right. Surf and turf is exactly what I'm talking about. That's two lobster tails and two filet mignons for free in your first box. Simply go to butcherbox.com forward slash dirty. That's butcherbox.com forward slash dirty. And uh, there's really no reason to uh, not take advantage of that and have some great surf and turf by going to butcherbox.com forward slash dirty. Okay, Prano, the World Series is here. I see yes. you are ready for it. You are wearing your Ray shirt. That's right. Got my Ray's, Ray's shirt on here. Um, the two best teams with the two best records. So it's kind of playing out how it should. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't be rooting harder for the Rays. Uh, I really I really had a mixed emotions on that Dodgers Brave series. Hate both those teams, the passion. Um, you know, you got to give credit to the Dodgers for in a yeah. way for, for coming back from three, one down, you could also criticize the Dodgers. Why are you down three, one in the first place? Um, certainly I would say a distinct talent advantage coming from the Dodger side going into the world series, but the Rays are young and, and certainly have plenty of less proven talent. Although that may, you know, they're in the world series and years from now we might be saying, the Rays were are far more talented, but but these guys are young. A lot of the guys, a lot of people have never heard of, and um, the Dodgers, the second highest payroll in baseball, so kind of not a surprise for the Dodgers to return. But at this point, the Dodgers are the '90s Buffalo Bills, and like, yeah. do do they get one? Yeah, and, and and I'll say it, and I know we've been critical, but I have to continue it. I'd say the, the Dodgers won that series despite Dave Roberts. Yeah. You know, and a lot, of, know, a lot, a lot of people were giving Roberts credit for managing that series. And I'm like, mm, okay. You also put yourself in a three, one hole. Yeah. And you also took out Bueller in game six at 89 pitches when he's throwing an absolute gem. He just does these, these mind boggling decisions that we, you know, you alluded to it earlier. Momentum is real. Yeah. Take that little analytics card, tear it up, throw, you know, whoever's telling him from what everybody says, the GM is calling the shots for the Dodgers. My thing is, you know, we keep talking about these analytics and the book and the math and the whatever. And I keep going back to blackjack because this is something that you hear whenever you play blackjack. Dealer's got a six. You don't hit. That's what the book says to do. Now, my problem across sports Baseball, for sure. The NFL, the fourth down calls, the two-point conversion calls, is the book is one thing. And, and first of all, I don't believe in the book in, the, in, in football nearly as much as I do in, you know, okay, the analytics in baseball say this. But here's what I'll say. Even in blackjack, you live and die by the book. But if you know, if you're smart enough to know, man, a lot of face cards have come out. I know exactly where I stand in this deck. You can, mit, you can take the book and you can adjust it given the situation. I just think a lot of these coaches, and Dave Roberts is a prime example, is somebody who goes, the numbers say this. I don't mind taking a look at your sheet, taking a look at the, what the computer says and saying, this is what the analytics say I should do. But saying, okay, this is what the analytics say I should do. And this is what I know about this given situation that the analytics have not factored in and putting those together. Like, again, we go back to the, 
you know, the Zimmer thing yesterday in the Vikings game, it's like the analytics say I should do this. Okay. But what about the team the fact that your team fucking stinks and maybe get them a point just to feel yeah. like we can score points. Dave Roberts is the poster child in major league baseball for just doing what it says in the book. And I just, I just think that that is a recipe for failure in the long run. And we'll see, like you said, I love the comparison of the Dodgers or the Buffalo bills and Look, they are talented. They are deep. We saw that in this series. They were down 3-1. I mean, the Dodgers can go deep in any position, pitching, you name it. They're the overall better team. They're more talented. They're the favorites. This is, and, then, and I've said it before. I, we, I'm sure we've got a title of an episode, but Dave Roberts is the Doc Rivers of Major League Baseball. It's like, okay, if you get one, good for you. Like, the failure is in if you only get one. True. In a way, you know? I mean, they so, are stacked. We'll see. I'm rooting hard for the Rays. Fuck the Dodgers. Fuck Chase Hutley. I got my Rays shirt. And uh, I'm, I'm all in. Let's go Rays. But, you know, one thing is going to happen. Either the hockey city is going to repeat or the basketball city is going to repeat. So that'll be interesting. And then what does that mean for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Tampa Bay. Like, is this the year of Tampa? Is this the year of L.A.? Wow, I never thought of that. Yeah, the hockey or basketball teams, cities will get matched. And then, you know, we've got football left. Uh, funny, like, girlfriend, uh, like, we'll, we'll call it, like, tales from cohabitation. But my, my girlfriend last night is going, so we won the World Series? I'm like, first of all, what is this we? And second of all, yeah, where's your pride the, for the Cardinals? I know. And I go, second of all, this is the NLCS. So I'm like, if you don't know what round of baseball we're in, maybe you're not a we. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can I can top you, by the way. Yeah, you got your tales from cohabitation. I can have my uh, my tales from uh, one of my brothers. Okay, I'm not gonna say his name, but uh, it rhymes with smelly it. Yeah. <laughs> so Elliot comes over. He's my oldest brother. He's the one I drove back from LA with. He's not the biggest sports guy, which is yeah. fine. He played sports growing up, but basically stopped in high school. So he comes over Saturday night, you know, being a good brother. This can be lonely here and obviously a lot of memories. So the brothers have been really great about popping over. And I got, I got the setup now, Joe, over here. I got Walt's 75 inch TV is no longer on the ground. Sorry, mm -hmm. dad. Uh, you know, I got my TV, like it's a great setup. So I got some college football games on. Oh, no, I had the, the NLCS on the big screen and then college football. And he's looking at the college football and he goes, he goes, uh, I know I don't watch that many sports and I know it's been around for a minute, but he goes, I'm still adjusting to the imaginary first down marker. What? Like the yellow line. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I'm still adjusting to that. For the and last 23 seasons. We, we, we Googled it. it. Yeah. It's been around for like 20 years. Yeah. He's still adjusting to the imaginary first down marker. <laughs> I was like, bro, you gotta watch He's like, look, sports. look, I know I'm not a big sports guy anymore. And uh, I know, I know, look, I'm just going to say it right up front. I know that I'm a little behind the times, but the forward pass, it is a, <laughs> it is a tough concept. I mean, you got it. You got the, this oblong ball and they're throwing it forwards and these guys running past patterns of sort it's i mean call me old-fashioned but the full house backfield the halfback the fullback the, the the quarterback you put them all back there i learned something funny about walt too you know we, we gotta we gotta honor walt's tradition even though you know he, you know he left us from this earth so I, I go over to my the neighbors who i like and, belichick but how do you think he matches up with a rockney <laughs> Is Army still the best team in America? <laughs> <laughs> so I Another go, national championship for Army. So I go over to the neighbors uh, across the street who've lived here for a while. And they're like in their 50s. And, and you know, they got three kids. Right? The kids are in their 20s, whatever. He says to me, he said, uh, he said, I know you like sports. You got a sports podcast. You ever want to come over here and watch some football? I said, yeah, of course. And he goes, you know, I asked your, I asked your dad for years. And he goes, I just assumed 
goes, your dad doesn't like sports. I go, what? He goes, because every time I asked him, you want to watch some sports? Have a couple of beers, Walt? He'd always say, I don't watch sports. And I was like, he's been lying to you for like 20 years. <laughs> he watches sports alone in the basement and drinks those beers by himself. It's funny though, because you're still in, you're still in like new nice neighbor mode. But the, the fact is, is like, you are that guy. You have been watching sports alone in the smut studio for as long as I've known you. And you'd be like, Hey, you want to come over and watch the game? You're like, you know, I'd love to, but it's just, I tweet. And you're like, I was like, yeah, I got the internet at my place. You're like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I look, know. you know, I'm just, uh, it's not the same when I'm not at home. My, my Twitter, I can, I can pause and take, video of the screen, do voiceovers. But what, you know what's great is that like, and I agree, you are right. That's a great call out of me that I've been doing it for my whole life. And my dad's been doing it. I love that my dad would lie. Be like, I don't yeah. really watch sports. Yeah. And I'm sitting here telling this guy like, yeah, he lied to you for the last 20 years. Yeah. He'd rather watch it depressingly in his basement by himself. Uh, NBA news, we got to get through some of this. Yeah. You alluded to it earlier. There's some stuff coming out, you know, some Clippers drama. Well, first of all, before we get to that, Clippers have hired a new coach. <clears throat> Ty Lue is the answer. Yeah. Have at it, Joe. I know you have a lot of thoughts on this. It's just, it's just so stupid. It's just so stupid. The idea that Bomber, who has done everything to turn around this Clippers franchise. Unlimited funds. Well, he, he doesn't want to play in the same stadium as Lakers. They, he's going to get him anything. He's going to get these free agents. He's going to, he's going to turn around the Clippers culture. Ty Lu, honestly, without LeBron James, Ty Lu wouldn't even be like in, like he wouldn't even be a coaching candidate. Yeah, I agree. The, the idea that you move on from doc and you replace him with like, Many worse doc like he, on, <laughs> honestly even just to go to fr- somebody who's from doc's staff who just like to me this just seems like the dumbest move ever especially like when you've got I, i'm not saying billy donovan was amazing and i'm not saying that mike d'antoni is the right fit for this roster but you have good coaches proven coaches that are available Ty Lu has proven nothing other than I can stay out of LeBron James' way. And honestly, you could argue that, again, like I've argued with Doc and, and those Celtics team, you could argue, and LeBron James, those LeBron James teams were for sure out, outgunned against the Warriors, but you could argue that at least Ty Lu cost them games of those series. Yeah. I, I just think it's, I just think like the idea that this is going to be what takes the Clippers to the next level is hilariously ludicrous to me. Well, and also, you know, the report that we're talking is it, it came out that there was some friction within the Clippers team as far as some of the preferential treatment that Kawhi got. So now to answer that, we're going to like give it high Lou. Yeah. Yeah. Does it like, does he give you any sort of sense of like, you know, leadership? No, because the athletic reported that some guys like Beverly and Lou, Lou Williams were mad that, you know, Kawhi, the, all the days he'd get off and that he would get to stay a lot of times in San Diego where he, where, he, you know, this is obviously before the bubble that he would show up late for the team plane and there would not be repercussions for their flights. There was a lot, you know, there was a lot of. Let's just talk about Kawhi. Like, let's, let's put the Ty Lu, the Clippers thing on the side here. I mean, basically no one has anything bad to say about Greg Popovich. Kawhi couldn't get along with him. It, it, it essentially ends his time with the Spurs. He goes to Toronto. Great. He's part of a championship team. But then why leave? You know, like, what was it about being on the Raptors? I mean, like. Trust me, I understand that LA is better than Canada, but like, what was it about that situation? You would think I found a good fit. I have a good coach. I have good teammates around me. What is it about Kawhi that he needed to go and do it somewhere else? And then you get here and they like, 
I, I get he's quiet. He's got the weird laugh. He's got the thing. But like in his own way, Kawhi's more problematic than a lot of stars. Well, yeah. I mean, when you hear stuff like this, I, I think because he's not boisterous and that he is introverted, I think we do lose sight of what you're alluding to, the problems he had with Popovich, which no one's had really. Yeah. The, the other problems that he's had in his career. It, it is interesting. And I and like now being And now being called out by his own like teammate. A, yeah, a Clippers team that is very veteran heavy. The guys have been in the league. Like they're as as far as the the guys on the Clippers, it's not really the type of place where you've got a lot of guys who are just kind of like throwing shit at the wall. I mean, most of those guys have been in the league for a long time, understand the sanctity of the locker room, and they're still throwing him under the bus. Yeah. I think it's concerning, and I think that it really is a good point of you're gonna bring in Ty Lu is not the guy to wrangle this and maybe mend the situation. Now, some of those guys like Harold is a free agent. He might not even be there. Uh, but it, it is interesting. Like, that's just not the type of guy. Ty Lu to me, and I could be wrong, he's the guy who you walk all over. Yeah. And I mean, literally, I, I, Allen, Allen Iverson. Allen Iverson did, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, Allen Iverson literally did that. Yeah. It's kind of symbolic. Of his it, it, it just seems to me like you, you Tyloo's pretty far down the list of guys that I would hire if I was if I had control of the Clippers. He's pretty far down the list. Now, does that mean those other guys didn't want the job? But it it you didn't really hear rumors of they talked to this guy, they talked to that guy. It just seemed like it was Tyloo's job after Doc left. Okay, well and let that me put- just seems seems crazy to me let let me pose this guy then and this guy's getting tossed around i know he had a meeting with the rockets last week and he's been out of coaching forever as an announcer would you rather have ty lu coaching the clippers or jeff van gundy i actually think jeff i'm not a big jeff van gundy fan i think jeff van gundy was an overrated head coach with the knicks he he did a decent job with the rockets um but i will say one thing no team in the nba fits bringing jeff van gundy back more than the clippers like, let's play some fucking defense. Let's be locked down. Let's like, like Pat Bev, Kawhi, Paul George, we are going to harass you and we're going to play, you know, like the idea of bringing back a sort of 90s style of we've got a couple closers and we're going to lock you down defensively. I mean, I would take Jeff and Gundy a thousand times out of a thousand over Ty Lue. Yeah, I and, agree. and and that's from a guy who you know doesn't think that there's a lot of places that Jeff Van Gundy fits coaching. Yeah. Well, the team that's interviewing him just lost their GM. Daryl Morey resigned, and obviously, I, th- I think there's a good discussion there. How we view his tenure, I I, I believe. I'll pull up the numbers as far as, you know, his success, but he was, he was very successful regular season. Um, obviously I think he, he was a very disappointing GM other than hiring Mike D'Antoni. Why do you say that? Because the Rockets did what is the epitome of failure in the NBA, which is they refused to tank and they were never like, they were never great until D'Antoni gets there. And they obviously the one seed one year he, he takes, he takes sort of a fledgling roster and says, well, if this is the style we're going to play, then you got to make this move and this move and this move. And then I'll go, you know, like taking D'Antoni and playing D'Antoni ball is going to get you X amount of wins. Now the, the, the ceiling on a D'Antoni team if you don't give him the talent is always overachieving in the regular season and then setting up this high standard and being like, Oh, they disappointed in the playoffs. It's like, man, they were never set up to be that good. But you look at the Daryl Morey before, like there was a lot of years where there were six, seven, eight cusp of the playoffs. Like that's never where you want to be in the NBA. You never want to be a seven, eight, nine seed. You just don't want to be it. Well, I forget the stat, 
I, and I can't. I mean, find I know it. he was there a while, so he's also probably responsible for some of those early teams. He was there 13 years. I mean, I mean look, they, I, th- I believe since 2015, or yeah, I think it's 2015, they won the most regular season games besides San Antonio and Golden State Warriors. Right. But you're right. Like a lot of playoff failure. I mean, you know, we can play the what if game, the Chris Paul injury, right? For game seven a couple years ago against the Warriors. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I mean, he obviously went all in. We talk about analytics. He went all in on the three pointer. Yeah. And saying, hey, three is greater than two, which you're a firm believer in. So that's why I'm curious to, you know, hear you over, overall say he was a disappointment. Maybe because he won no titles and they never even made the, uh, the finals. Right. And, and again, the taking, embracing the D'Antoni style of ball and saying like, we embrace the three and this guy likes to play this style and we're going to go whatever. That's fine. But also let's just talk about like the splashiest most recent move. Russell Westbrook fucks that whole thing up. Now you're taking a guy who only likes to shoot off the dribble threes. He, he insists on going to the basket. It's like you went all in on this thing, but then you didn't even go all in on it. Yeah. You, you then brought a second point guard to take some of the ball control out of James Harden. And it's a guy who's not a three point shooter. Well, now they're stuck with those. Oh, they're going to be bad. Now, yeah. now, like, forget Maury. Dan Tony leaves. They're going to be bad. Because they got Russ and, and Harden on those deals. And obviously those guys are, let's not forget, you know, when those guys made the finals when they played on OKC with Durant. It was 2012. Yeah. That was a long time ago. Not that they're old because they're, you know, they entered the league so young, but those guys are in their 30s. Uh, you got to give Harden some credit. Harden's game has changed. And, you know, there was an evolution of Harden that became an MVP and became viable in, in the current NBA. Like, I just feel like Westbrook's game is antiquated at this point. Yeah, I mean, he had his MVP season. He's got to evolve. Like, gun to your head right now, you want Lillard or you want Russell Westbrook? Oh, that's not even a question. Right. Yeah, it's not even a question. I think you're right. I think they're going to suck. They're going to really struggle. Without D'Antoni, it's like I just think that they're they're going to they'll be a joke. And like the idea of bringing a a, a Jeff Van Gundy type into there, oh boy, that would be a, a disaster. Yeah, I don't like that at all. Well, Joe, I think I've figured out a way. We're not going to do it today, but I think I might have figured out a way for us to do calls. So if you guys have calls, give the hotline a ring. 310-359-8365. We'll set that up for next episode as, as long as I can uh, try to figure this out. So drop a call, Dirt Balls. Uh, thanks for the support. Leave an iTunes review, rate, review. Uh, once my koozies come in, I, I have so many koozies probably from this entire year to send out. I'll send you koozies if you leave your Instagram or Twitter handle on an iTunes review. So drop that. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Andy Ruther or us at the dirty sports is the show. Yes. Joe, uh, are you doing any perform? Like what's going on here? Are we doing any? Uh... No, I did that drive through show a couple weeks ago, but otherwise there's really not a lot going on. Um, trying to find a way to press on during the pandemic. But right now it's just, uh, I guess, follow me on Instagram at Joe Prano, follow me on Twitter at Fix Your Life. Got a couple of different um, content things maybe in the works, so keep your eye out for that. I'll, and obviously, I will anything I have, I will continue to promote here. Uh, if you want to uh, get get a cameo from me, I'm still on Cameo. Uh, whatever, just keep keep drinking Miller Light, keep you know reviewing Dirty Sports for now, and I'll let you know what else comes up. Such weird times, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it crazy to think we're, we're over seven months without comedy shows at comedy clubs in Los Angeles? It's, it's funny. I don't know if you saw this tweet that was going around on Twitter that was like, do a po- like poorly describe what you do for a living. 
And it's like, you know, a year ago, it would have been some joke about, you know, my comedy, like complaining about my relationship in front of a crowd. And now it's like poorly describe your job. I'm like trying to get people to appreciate the greatness of LeBron James and Miller Lite. (laughs) 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 That's my job. Yeah, that's funny. Trying to get people to properly rate LeBron James, Ryan Fitzpatrick, and Miller Lite. (laughs) Well, it looks like they're going to start doing shows at Go Bananas in Cincinnati. Out of curiosity, I just went to their website. Well, Andy, hit them up. Tell them I'll come and headline. I'd love to have you open for me. (laughs) Well, well, uh, hold on. And by shows, this is is not looking good. Jesus. The, The only shows on their website... October 29th, a stick or treat Halloween show. So that's still 10 days from now. Then there's no shows until. Anytime you've got Yiddish words in your, <laughs> in your promos. Come down for stick or treat. Yeah. Then the next show is not for another two weeks, which is uh, November 12th through the 15th. And then the next show is not until New Year's Eve. So maybe I spoke a little too soon by saying, oh, you know, comedy's back in, like, wow. I saw a, San, uh, there's, I think San Diego American Comedy Club, they might be having, they might have people in like glass boxes. I'm not kidding. They might have like comedians inside of a, a fish tank doing comedy. God, it's such weird times we live in. Weird times. I mean, I mean, there's a half acre in back of this house. It's about to hit Let's wind. do it. Let's but do like it. summer. Get some heat lamps. Walt's Comedy Club. Can't wait. Occupy Wall Street. Love it. All right, Prano. Hang in there, buddy. Uh, good seeing you, even though it's, it's via Zoom. But uh, y- you know I'll make my way out there once, once, I, once this weather hits. Go Rays. Go Rays. Go Russ. You know, the uh, huge. Limited. <laughs> Dirtballs, thanks for the support. You guys have a great week. We'll be back on Thursday. And as always, stay 